All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, a little local grassroots nonprofit uh, whose mission is to preserve and protect one of our most natural, one of our most important natural resources, water. Um, who here has ever used water before? So um, we're really excited for tonight's program. And uh, thanks again for uh, joining us and um, uh, being part of our lecture series. So um, I'd like to give a special uh, shout out and thank you to our sponsors, um, Clean Harbors and Clear Water Recovery, as well as the Mass Cultural Councils of Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate, um, all provided us with support for educational programs like this and others. So we're always really happy to have uh, their support for programs like this, um, as well as all of your support for tuning in. Uh, we've been averaging about 100 to 150 uh, participants each Wednesday lecture. So these are great uh, record numbers, and we're really excited that all of you are tuning in. Um, and so those of you who aren't able to join us live every Wednesday, night um, are also watching the recordings on YouTube. Every one of these will be on YouTube through our website. Um, and so you can watch them after the fact. And we have had uh, close to 900 uh, registrants for the uh, 2023 Water Watch Lecture Series, which is absolutely just a beyond uh, incredible and, and great that so many people are, are interested in these topics. So um, uh, as always, um, the watershed is really excited to partner with uh, Mass Audubon, and uh, Doug Lowry is here with us, of course, tonight. So, uh, Doug, I'm send it over to you for a moment. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, and again, thanks everybody for for really supporting this lecture series. We're, we're so excited that there's this kind of uh, interest in this, and uh, it's a, a testament. Uh, you know, we. It, one point we discussed are people zoomed out and they had enough of zoom and this is obviously no not not yet so we really appreciate your your time with us and we here at mass audubon certainly uh like to use this as an opportunity to celebrate uh our partnership with the watershed association again an amazing organization uh our our towns would not look the same without this without the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. So we're we're very proud to co-sponsor this uh, series with them. Uh, we, again, and, and Brian and I and, and all the staff at, at uh, both the Watershed and Mass Audubon invite you to attend our final uh, program in the series. And that's at Stellwagen Beer Company, uh, right on Enterprise Drive in Marshfield on March 1st. Uh, continuing on Wednesday nights, and it's kind of the bookend of this series. We started with a live program, and we're going to end with a live program. And it's a climate cafe, and climate cafes work really well, especially when there's uh, large attendance. So uh, we hope you join us uh, and enjoy, if you do, if you choose, enjoy a, a really great beverage, locally brewed beverage. Thank you, Brian. Back to you. Great. Thanks, Doug. We're always excited to partner with Mass Audubon, a, a real treasure to the state, especially in the South Shore. The sanctuaries, if you haven't been to some of Mass Audubon's sanctuaries, you got to go. They're, they're absolutely, they're wonderful places. So, all right. Uh, really excited for um, tonight's program. Um, we have here a very special person uh, who who is uh, a South Shore uh, native. So I would like to, and really excited and happy to introduce Wayne Tucker. Um, Wayne has launched the 11 Names Project uh, with a mission to create and increase digital footprints of Black, Indigenous, and multiracial people in Massachusetts during the time of slavery. So 1638 to 1783. He is a, Wayne, uh, is a South Shore native passionate about inclusive history and genealogy. In addition to his website, the11names.com, which I will put in the chat, uh, his work has been featured in the Bay State Banner. He is the recipient of a research grant from the Northeast Slavery Records Index, and he is the author of Slavery in Hanover, Massachusetts, 1727 to 1783, a research guide authored for the Hanover Historical Society. So, Wayne, we're really excited to have you. Thanks so much for being here tonight, and um, the, uh, the audience is now yours. Feel free to share and uh, take it away. 
Thank you, Brian. Can you see my slide presentation? Yes, I can. Pardon me. The the Zoom menu is over the oh yeah over the uh, yep. PowerPoint. No worries. So oh. This presentation is uh, slavery in Black life in the North River communities from 1673 to 1685. Uh, Starting off with some acknowledgements, I want to thank the NSRWA. I want to thank its board and all of its members. I want to thank the audience for showing up today. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you, Brian Taylor, for reaching out and setting all this up and doing all the work to get this uh, up and running. Um, I want to thank the Hanover Historical Society and the Norwell Historical Society for support they've shown for me in the past and a, a willing, willingness to work with me. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Caleb. Caleb Estabrooks. We don't know each other, but uh, if you don't know, Caleb gave this barn burner presentation that's on Vimeo. Uh, you can find it online if you Google Google it. Uh, just a very great presentation on the North River shipbuilding, uh, and it was able to round out my knowledge of, of, of shipbuilding. I've watched it several times, and it's really helped me understand, um, you know, the passion and the zeal surrounding uh, the North River, its history, and shipbuilding. Um, so thank you, Caleb, for sharing that great, great presentation. That was both a mix of personal essay and factual presentation. Um, I want to acknowledge Peter Hainer. I think he had something to do with connecting us uh, to, you know, the, the organization and connecting with me. Um, and I want to thank Peter's wife, uh, Patty Hainer, who's done, um, who was the pioneer, who I'm going to tell you some things that in, in this that you'll be learning for the first time. but Patty has been writing about this for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, some of the things that I thought I discovered, uh, you know, you know, like any white man who discovers anything, like typically there's someone else uh, that's been saying, been talking about it, has been writing about it and had, has known about it for, for a long time. And that's what would happen is I'd find something and I dig deeper into it. I'm like, oh, Patty Kaner has always already been there, done that. Uh, but I am going to tell a story that uh, you know she has told in the past uh, in, in one of my um, little vignettes. Uh, I want to do a quick note on terminology. Um, if I there's some outdated terminology, the racial descriptors that were used at the time. So if I I will not refer to anybody as a Negro, but if I use that term, I know that I'm using it in quotes. I'm quoting directly from a source. Um, there, there's another term that I don't think I use in my presentation, but you should be aware of. Um, for a mixed race person, they, they'd be considered a uh, mulatto. Uh, obviously, that's an offensive and outdated term, and we wouldn't use it. But um, what you should know is different from the antebellum South in Massachusetts, a lot of the people of mixed race, probably most of the people of mixed race who that term would refer to were a mix of uh, African American, African, and uh, Indian, um, or they might have all three racial backgrounds. Um, there was, of course, intermixing between uh, Native populations and white people and African and white people, and the term does refer to anybody of mixed race, but the population in and around Massachusetts, if you see that term, it's mostly, there's a very good chance that it's mostly referring to people of mixed African and native heritage. And also, I just wanna say, this presentation is about slavery. So there will be uh, some discussion of graphic acts of violence. And I, I can understand if that's not something you're, you, you wanna hear tonight, but I, I do wanna let you know um, going forward, there will be some, Discussion on that. Uh, for the first slide, this is a prologue slide, and this slide is called um, Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname. And Suriname was this very notoriously violent and tough uh, slave society uh, on the coast of South America. Um, and this was this painting was painted uh, in the 18th, excuse me, the 1750s by John Greenwood. He was a Boston painter, and these are all real Rhode Island ship captains. And several governors who, you know, at one time or another, they would be uh, governors. And as you can see, they're, you know, they're, they're smoking, they're gambling, they're drinking, overindulging. Uh, you'll also see enslaved bodies depicted in this 
uh, seen. And a couple more over here on the bottom left, that's hard to see. And you might be asking yourself, well, what do you know, slave ca sh ship captains from Rhode Island have to do with the North River? Well, this man in the center right here, who's being vomited on and who's having water or rum poured over his face, his name is Joseph Wanton. He is the grandson of Edward Wanton, of Wanton Shipyard, which was in Situate and is now in Norwell. And I use this slide because I want to paint the picture that the North River wasn't some quaint frontier self-sustaining backwater. It was a node in the Atlantic economy. It was a node in the greater Atlantic world. And the Wanton name uh, was a major name in, in the history of slavery in New England. Um, so what do we mean by North River communities? If you're not from the area, I'm defining the North River communities as Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, which Hanson broke off from in 1820, and Situate, which broke off, which Norwell broke off from in 1849. And uh, as a total of the population, the, the four communities are about 6,016. As you can see, about 4.2% of the population were Black or Indian or of mixed race. Um, that runs the gamut in, in the towns. Uh, Pembroke is at 3.5%, which is still above average. The, the, the colony-wide average was about 3%. Um, and then Marshall at 3.9%. Hanover, uh, I estimate at 4.1%. I had to do some modeling because the, the, the data wasn't there. And you see Situate Norwell, uh, about 4.8% of the of, of, of situates population, 4.8% were black or Indian. Um, you might think to yourself, 4%, 5%, that's not a large amount. But another thing to consider is that in places like Situate, Hanover, and Norwell, about 10% of the households at any given time would house enslaved people. 10% of the households in our you know, Plymouth County communities, at least closer to the water, would have held enslaved people. And it, the, the numbers decrease the further you wait, further away you get from the water. And this, this map is from the Norwell Historical Commission and it shows where all of those historic, um, you know, ship, shipyard markers are. Now there were, of course, you know, this shows nine sites. Of course, there were more than nine shipyards. There were, and some came and go and some were right next to each other. Um, so, you know, nine isn't a great uh, data point, but, you know, for the most part, using this map and, and using Briggs's ship building on North River, it seems that more shipyards were on the Situate Norwell side of the river than were on the Marshfield and Pembroke side. And over here, you can see, I don't know if the, um, if, uh, if my face is over this pie chart, but if you wanted to minimize it, you could see it. Um, the distribution of the people, you know, forty percent of that of um, oops, forty percent of this four point two percent population, or about two hundred fifty-two people, uh, forty-eight percent of that lived in, in, in Situate slash Norwell. The um, now. There, uh, there was a big enslaved population in Situate, uh, mainly because there was um, you know, Situate just had a much larger population in general, general population larger than any of the other towns. So of course, it makes sense that it would have um, more enslaved people. But the overall population of Situate for the region was about 41%. And here we see that it housed about 48% of the enslaved population. And I, I can't prove this, I don't know this for a fact, but my hypothesis is, is because there were more shipyards in Situate than there were in the other towns, it was one of the driving factors for having more enslaved people. But, you know, of course, more research would have to um, be done to, to prove that. Uh, so first I'm gonna give you a little Introduction to uh, slavery in Massachusetts. Um, it's very quick. This could be its own hour long presentation in and of itself. Uh, but many South Shore residents assumed that they would have to travel to Virginia or Mississippi to touch and experience landmarks where slavery was practiced. However, we need look no further than our own neighborhoods. 
Slavery was widespread in Massachusetts and instrumental to New England's growth and development. The slave economy was not the sole purview of the wealthy. The yeomen and craftsmen classes, including shipwrights, coopers, farmers, and blacksmiths and tanners relied on enslaved labor. The reach of slavery was not just confined to Boston. It extended into the countryside, including Plymouth County. Additionally, Massachusetts was the first British North American colony to legalize slavery. Enslaved Africans and Indians labored in agricultural, agriculture, cultivating and harvesting crops, and working in husbands, husbandry, you know, tending to the animals. Um, Bonds people were further employed as house servants, cooks, maids, nurses, coachmen, blacksmiths, street fellers, carpenters, coopers, and sawyers. They worked in homes, tanneries, farms, foundries, mills, ships, and shipyards. The skilled labor of these people were highly valued. Um, children were frequently trafficked. Tradesmen sought 12 and 13 year olds who could be trained as apprentices and that could never strike out and form their own business. Additionally, infants were considered by slaveholders an encumbrance. Reverend Jeremy Belknap once observed that enslaved infants were given away like puppies. Given away like puppies. We see instances of this locally. Uh, in Hanover, church records, we find this baptism announcement, July 17, 1748, Britain, a Negro infant born in the house of Mr. Edward Jenkins of Situate and given to John Studley of Hanover soon after birth. And then six months later, we find Britain, a Negro child of John and Elizabeth Studley has died. The economy of New England was wholly intertwined and dependent on the business of slavery. New England ships, manned by New England sailors, carried a diverse range of goods, including enslaved Indians, fish, livestock, timber, and other provisions to West Indian sugar plantations. These commodities were then exchanged for the goods such as sugar, molasses, rum, uh, which was produced by enslaved Africans. And sometimes they would trade for enslaved Africans. West Indian goods were re-exported via the coastal trade with some being consumed here in the North River communities. You can, if you look at colonial uh, uh, probate inventories, they're filled with sugar, molasses, rum. Uh, it even says West India rum. Uh, they would definitely consumed these slave produced goods here on the South shore. And then of course, one of the big things that we produced here in Massachusetts was rum. We would import the molasses and then send the rum to Africa to trade for enslaved people. This deserves to be reiterated. The foundation of the colonial Massachusetts economy was the business of slavery. And this is not my opinion. This is the mainstream belief of current historians and scholars. Everything was interconnected. You know, I've heard a lot of talk that, well, shipbuilding on the North River wasn't really connected to slavery. It was mainly uh, ships built for the coastal trade. Well, I can tell you that 59% of the goods we exported in Massachusetts coastal trade were West Indian slave labor produced goods. Again, that golden triangle of sugar, rum, and molasses, but other things like salt, cotton, and tobacco as well. Um, another example to think about is the many links in the vast supply, production, and trade chains. We know local enslaved men cut down trees. We can see that in Plymouth County court records. Local enslaved men worked at sawmills, so that's in the record. Local, uh, you know, they worked at sawmills. Um, you, local enslaved men were hired out to cart uh, lumber. If you didn't, if you weren't an enslaver, you could pay an enslaver and hire their enslaved men or women for day labor. So there are account books that talk about like, well, I needed so-and-so's enslaved man to cart the lumber to the mill. Um, so to think about the vast supply chain and the, in, in, oh, we already talked about that, I'm sorry. Um, you know, so you look at the many different touch points where an enslaved person could have touched, um, and we're only talking about shipbuilding, maybe house building, Cooper, like just wood in general. There's many different touch points. Like, so if you're sitting in a, a, a classic, one of these um, antique homes in your, your community, and you can touch original beams that were from the 17th or 18th century, you know, it might not have touched enslaved hands, 
or but there's a very good chance it, it, it did at least some of the timber but you, you we just don't know again i don't want to recast the north river as you know south carolina rice plantations but there it, slavery was so mundane and common that it, it, you have to understand that enslaved people were in every single type of job uh you know if a white person did it a black person certain also did it um also enslaved indians um another thing to to note slavevoyage.org demonstrates that at least 24 ships built on the south shore transported enslaved people including 10 built on the north river north river ships carried new england provisions such as salted meat fish lumber livestock and draft animals to the caribbean slave labor plantations and brought back like i said slave produced sugar rum molasses cotton salt and tobacco and there was such a demand from the from the business of slavery that in 1753 there was a, a shipbuilding boom and most of the most of the ships were built outside of boston and the largest portion of ships were built on the south shore 20, in 1953 the South Shore from Hull down to Plymouth, 23% uh, of the ships colony wide were produced on the South Shore. And of course, the North River economy surely benefited. So, to try and argue that any individual or family in colonial times was not was insulated from and not entangled up in the abhorrent human traffic, trafficking scheme known as the Atlantic Strave trade, trade is as futile as arguing that I'm insulated or I'm not involved with fossil fuels. It was just that integral to the economy. Same way that fossil fuels are integral to our modern economy, the business of slavery is what propped up colonial New England. In, it, in addition to Africans, New Englanders also enslaved Native Americans. This practice started, this, it started really to ramp up during uh, the Pequot War it really should be called the Pequot Massacre. It was very one-sided, uh, and that was 1636 to uh, 1638. Um, and even before that, uh, remember Squanto or Tisquantum? He was uh, Massasoit's uh, translator. You know, why did he speak English? It's because he was kidnapped from the shores of Plymouth in 1614 and trafficked into Spain. Uh, and when he, he he made it back to the remnants of his smallpox destroyed uh, Patuxent village. Uh, and then and, and then later in the 17th century, uh, the practice of Native American slavery really ramped up in King Philip's War. And after that war, about a thousand Native American men were shipped out of the colony and sent to places like the Caribbean, uh, Tangier, and, and the Azores. Uh, and those were, they were traded for enslaved Africans, and a lot of the uh, local uh, men, local women and children were then enslaved. Um, so that's a brief overview of slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, I apologize that it was so um, so quick. You know, like I said, it deserved, You know, it fills several volumes of books. It's a good hour-long presentation. It's a, a you know, a semester-long class at, at, at college, uh, but I hope I was able to convey how important slavery was to the overall economy of Massachusetts and New England. So that brings us to our first vignette, our first story of uh, of Walter Maria or Maria in Walter Briggs in her freedom suit. So. Slavery started in 1638, and uh, it's roughly bookended by the date 1638 and 1783. Um, in Plymouth County, the, one of the best records we have is the 1963 sale of, of, of an African child named Mariah to shipbuilder Wattle Briggs of the Briggs Shipyard. Um, he buys her from Margaret Cock in Boston, and I want to note. But you'll see some of my slides there tagged activists. So there's a lot of uh, traumatic stories that uh, come from the archives of our local communities about slavery. There's no feel good slavery story, is there? 
Um, but I want to show that the, from the very beginning, we know that these people were working to uh, make their own lives better, to fight for freedom, to you know claim human rights that they've been stripped of. Uh, th this wasn't you know just they weren't just passively hanging out waiting for 1783 and the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts to happen. Uh, there are tons of stories of, of freedom and resistance, and we'll see uh, three more slides with uh, with activists. Uh, so I hope that balances out some of what some of the unfortunate things I have to talk about. So this right here is from a, a book written by L. Vernon Briggs about his, the genealogy of his family. He also wrote the shipbuilding book, but this comes from a different book. This is a reproduction. Uh, in that book of the original 1673 bill of sale, uh, where he bought um, this girl. Uh, I doubt Maria worked on the shipyard, but I do know Briggs enslaved another African man named Jimmy, who, presu who presumably did labor on the shipyard. Uh, upon his death in 1694, Briggs stipulated that Maria would be free after 13 years of service. After toiling in several households, but always human property, Mariah was finally free. One problem, in the, she had a, a child in that interstitial 13 year period. Given the convention that the status of the child follows that of the mother, and because Mariah was enslaved at the time of birth, uh, Briggs's heirs argued that young Molly was their property. Mariah's husband, Tony Sisko, was enslaved by the Reverend Nathaniel Eels. Uh, Nathaniel Eels was just one of Hundreds, I have found at least 100 ministers in Massachusetts that have, that held people in slavery. Uh, and I can always share that record with you if you want to reach out independently. But uh, it was very common for the very first minister in town to be a slaveholder or, and then subsequent ministers after that. Um, so he was in, Tony was enslaved by Nathaniel Eels. And Nathaniel Eels, even though he was an enslaver, he took up the status of next friend. Mariah, when people in colonial courts who didn't have access to the courts, like single women or enslaved women, uh, they would need a white man to stand in and be their prochaine ami, their next friend. Um, and they sued. And this is one of the seven identified, 70 identified freedom suits that start in 1666 when Indians started to use the courts to fight for their freedom. Uh, and that stretch of 70 cases stretch into 1783. Elizabeth Freeman and Quack Walker, the famous cases that lead to Hitchwit Judge, uh, Judge uh, Cushing, uh, Chief Justice William, you know, the highway, Chief Justice Cushing of the highway fame. Um, he was a slaveholder, but he also was the one who uh, adjudicated the case that is said to have started gradual emancipation here in Massachusetts. Uh, unfortunately, after Mariah and Tony win the case to, for Molly's freedom, uh, she passes away. And then the Briggs heirs appeal. And then uh, Eels again appeals as Molly, this time it's Molly's first enemy, uh, next friend. Uh, and, and in 1720, the case is, is again ruled in favor of Molly, and she now has proved her freedom uh, for the final time. The next story is about Captain John Williams. Some of you know the Men of Kent Cemetery in uh, Situate, and one of the best examples of a 17th century headstone is that of Captain John Williams. Um, and this is the Barker Tavern on the Situate waterfront. Uh, it was, uh, it's now up for sale. Uh, so let me just say, it, reading from John Williams' will, he says, I give and bequeath to my two boys and children, George and Thomas, whom I attained with my sword and my bow, and whom I, I will that they be surnamed after my name, these George Williams and Thomas Williams. The, my boys whom I attained with my sword and my bow. So just like the previous um, slide, Mariah, she obviously was separated from her mother. Again, we have child separation, an example of a child separation. This is only the second, um, Story, and we've had three examples of, of child separation. So to say that there was, they used to call New England slavery familial slavery, 
uh, you know, this kind of kinder, gentler slavery. But we, we can see right away that this is not the case. Um, Captain Williams Situate Home is remembered as a landmark because it was a garrison for the English settlers during the, the um, King Philip's War. Today, it stands as a now for sale Barker Tavern. Uh, when the Indian forces sacked and burned Situate in 1675, Williams was not amongst those garrisoned in his home. His 30-man raging unit was patrolling Middleborough and harassing King Philip's encampment at Assawampsett. Captain Williams and his Situate men later attacked Mount Hope, Rhode Island, during King Philip's last stand, where they assaulted Philip's forces from the flank opposite uh, Benjamin Church's notorious regiment. Mount Hope, originally the home, originally the home to uh, originally known to the English as uh, Massasoit or Usamequin's seat, uh, is also where Usamequin's son, Metacomet, aka King Philip, kept his home and headquarters. Here, Metacomet was killed, and his body was decapitated, mutilated, and his head was displayed on a pike in Plymouth Town Square opposite the first church for 20 years. Uh, the genocidal King Philip's War accelerated the explosion of shadow, shadow slavery in New England, after the war, a thousand men were sold to foreign slave markets and roughly the same amount of Africans were enslaved in this region. Additionally, about 20 to 40 percent of the surviving Indian population was held in bondage by the white colonies, white colonists. Uh, the children, George and Thomas mentioned in Williams' probate file, were likely trophies from that war. Both Williams' niece, Deborah Barker, and his wife, Elizabeth Lathrop Williams, accused Williams of abuse and Elizabeth won the right to separate. Williams is also the situate slaveholder who, in 1886, uh, pressed burglary charges against a man he enslaved named John Negro, who was sentenced to stand at the gallows for an hour and be burnt in the hand with the letter B. Williams' probate inventory values Indian men Will, George, and Tom at 60 pounds. However, no, African, no people of African descent appear in this document, and Negro, John Negro's fate remains unclear. Uh, Williams goes on to give each of these Indian men 15 tracts of land in both Boston, 15 acres of land in Boston and Seekonk. So these men are, are simultaneously shown as property in the, the probate inventory, and he's giving them property. So what do we make of these bequests? Um, Williams' probate file does not acknowledge any surviving genetic children. And while Williams' bequest, you might misinterpret the, uh, as infection for his captives, he was legally responsible to support uh, these men. If these men were left in poverty and assuming they stayed in the town of Situate and did not join a tribal community, it would be the town's responsibility to support Will, George, and Thomas. And if Situate found themselves with three paupers to support, it would be within the town's right to sue Williams' estate for the money to support this man by writing bequests to these men Williams remains in control of his how how his estate supports the former bondsmen. So he wanted to remain in control of how they were supported. What's more, we must consider that Captain Williams may bear responsibility for the deaths of the these men's parents and family. Or perhaps the two children were not orphaned and they were just stripped from their mother's care. Furthermore, these men were forced into 18 years of bondage that they did not agree to and at least two of the men were too young to communicate and consent to such an agreement. We should definitely not grant Captain Williams a, a redemption arc and we should re resist that urge. Uh, so back to Edward Wanton. Um, here is another data point that places slavery directly on North River waters and shipyards. Uh, if you've read uh, the, the Briggs book carefully, you've certainly come across mention of this um, runaway ad. Uh, but you may never have seen it. I, I dug into the archives and I was able to find it uh, on an online database. Um, England board Edward Wanton was a Boston congregational who, as tradition goes, assisted the execution of the Boston martyrs or Cure Quakers and Puritans executed for practicing their faith. Disturbed by the injustice, Wanton adopted Quakerism and faced persecution even after moving to 80 acres in Situate, which is now Norwell, he was a successful religious teacher and established a shipbuilding business, the location of which we, we know of today. And you can visit if you paddled the North River. As we've already discussed, the wanton name is prominent in New England slavery. And it begins with Edward. 
on screen, we see the 1712 ad where the Quaker ship, the Quaker ship carpenter is seeking Daniel, a 19 year old man, tall, thick curled hair and a bush behind, if not lately cut off. Um, Daniel appears again in a 1714 runaway ad. He still wants his property, but he has been hired out to live with his son-in-law, John Scott in Newport. In this ad, Daniel is described as a ship carpenter. It's very important, that, that detail is very important because it acknowledges that Daniel has very valuable skills. He is valued as a skilled laborer. Um, and then after this, uh, after the 1714 ad, Daniel shows up for a third time in Edward Wanton's will, uh, either still run away from 1714 or run away again. Um, note that I've tagged this slide activist. Running away is definitely a form of activism and self-advocacy. And if Daniel had never run away, we might not have known if he ever existed or his name. Uh, and I, I think that's just incredible. We are able to tease out you have a little bit of a description of him in, in what he was wearing and what he looked like. Um, he is described as mixed, uh, using that other term uh, that I try not to use. So perhaps he is of both African and Native American. We don't know what his racial mix was, but we could maybe guess. Um, and I, I think that's cool. Uh, you know, another interesting about Wanton is he owned shares in some of the ships that he built. Uh, a lot of the records are, are lost, but um, he one of the ways that he made his wealth was owning shares in, in the ships they built. And no doubt those ships carried, uh, you know, slave produced goods either from the West Indies or in, in the coastal trade. Uh, so he was certainly, and he was aware of what they were transporting. So he was really actively intertwined into the business of slavery. Uh, and of course, his two sons became governors or two of his sons became governors and slave traders and two of his grandsons were governors and slave traders and they were quite wealthy. And that empire was launched from Wanton Shipyard. Uh, one interesting, another interesting thing, like he was, Wanton was partnered with a, a man named Benjamin Gallup. Uh, not much is written about him, but if you look into Benjamin Gallup, you'll find some pretty interesting things about two different cases uh, with pirate ships uh, that I don't have time to get into, but worth looking into. This next one, so on the right, you see an original court transcript from 1722. Sparrow Boyce of Pembroke, a white single woman, gave birth to a child out of wedlock in 1716 and confessed that Squire, a Negro man, was the father. Furthermore, Boyce birthed another child in 1722 and confessed that Richard, a Negro man of Marshall, was the father. The court decided from this transcript, it says the court ordered her to be publicly whipped 10 stripes and pay fees and charges, which combined with the previous charges totaled 33 shillings, eight pence. The sentences of whipping were immediately executed upon her. That's a direct quote from the trial transcript. Uh, so you can see, um, I'll be honest with you, I think this was a consensual relationship because if you also look in Plymouth County court records, there are both white uh, men and men of color being prosecuted for sexual crimes, sexual assault, sexual violence. Uh, I, I think if Sarah was victimized in that sense, um, she would have, you know, they would have been prosecuting the, the fathers or going after the fathers that she would have been spared. Uh, also, if you look at this record closely and you read the, the records before and after, um, there are three or four more cases. And in each case, the couple only pay fines and they have the means to pay the fines. It's only Sarah Boyce, the woman who has multiracial children, who is faced with whipping. Uh, any kind of, she's the only one who faces corporal punishment. Everyone else is a, a, allowed to pay their way out of the, the case. Uh, here I'm gonna talk about Rose and an unnamed enslaved woman at Barstow's Forge. This is 1728. Um, I, I include this slide because it, first it, it shows, you know, someplace you could walk to and, you know, walk in the same footsteps as uh, enslaved people. Uh, this is the, 
you might recognize this, but this is South Hanover over by Mayettes and the um, historic Hanover Fire Station. The house represents where the Barstos would live and the factory symbol is where the anchor forge was. And this anchor forge passed through many hands, I think it eventually went to Joseph Jocelyn, who also lived on the street. Um, but the Barstows had two enslaved women and Joseph Barstow had two enslaved women and his son Joshua had an enslaved person. Uh, and this, I, 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 the two points I wanna make with this slide is you can go to places where people were enslaved and you don't have to be on the water, it's all over. And second, the shipbuilding industry supported other industries within the towns. You know, to have a shipbuilding industry, you need a lumber industry, you need sawmills, you need a forge, you need coopers, uh, blacksmiths, tanners. Um, towns need that anyway, but with the additional industry, those uh, industries can thrive even more and get more business. Uh, and Cooper, uh, not coopers, um, cobblers. If you ever find uh, the, uh, an account book of a cobbler from colonial times, you've got gold. You're probably going to find the names of a lot of enslaved people in your local town. Um, so if anybody knows where there's any cobbler account books in any historical society or library, let me know because I'd love to take a look at them. This one is really disturbing. Uh, in September of 1730, Nicholas Litchfield of uh, Situate sued Israel Cowing of Situate. Cowing sold uh, Litchfield a black man named Jack and a woman named Surrey for 160 pounds, but Surrey was not delivered. Cowing had promised to deliver uh, deliver these individuals well and in good order, but Surrey was mad distracted or possessed of the devil, which lit Litchfield was wholly ignorant. Excuse me. Subs subsequently, Surrey was hanged and dead. Uh, and if you waded through the, uh, th this is the original record you see on the right. Um, Surrey was hanged and dead. That is quite the use of the passive voice. Um, the question arises: why are we learning this as a fraud case and not an inquiry into murder? Um, it seems that Surrey may have been suffering from mental illness or it's not impossible that she sees one of the few methods of resistance and died by suicide. But to me, this record does not read as a suicide. I think they would have stated explicitly that she died by suicide. I think they would have uh, definitely specified that. Um, I don't know what to make of this record. Uh, you know, I don't know if Suri was facing a mental health crisis or perhaps she was practicing an African religious practice and it freaked out howling. Um, or maybe she was just resisting and she was not being the docile, uh, obedient, enslaved servant. Um, I don't know. Whatever, whatever the case is, it seems that Cowling or someone thought it was just easier to execute Surrey rather than deal with whatever was going on with Surrey. Uh, this is just, and again, another data point, another reminder that slavery in the North, slavery in England was not a, a cakewalk. It was definitely a violent and brutal institution. Next, Newport marries Kate in Hanover in 1760. You know, so far we've seen several types of records attesting to black life in the North River, the North River region. Uh, we've discussed runaway ads, bills of sale, probate files, and court records. But one of the best sources for records on black life in Massachusetts is the church records. Here we see an original uh, Hanover church record recording Newport marrying Kate, quote, Negro slaves belonging to Nathaniel Sylvester. Nathaniel Sylvester was a shipbuilder who owned property along the North River on both sides of the Hanover and Norwell town lines. Um, for decades, he owned property that is uh, Barstow's Two Oaks Yards uh, by the Washington Street Bridge um, in Hanover, right when, and if you go down the river, it turns into Norwell. Uh, again, this is another primary source that links slavery to the river and to the shipyards. Um, you know, along with marriage records, you'll find baptismal records, church admissions, uh, and in some towns, discipline records for admonishment to return to weekly meetings or confessions of drunkenness or wickedness uh, by people of all stripes, and including uh, 
people of African heritage. So dig into your church records. So now we turn to the forgotten patriots. Uh, pretty much every town in Massachusetts sent black, mixed, or Native American people to fight in the revolution. Um, researchers have identified over 17,000 patriots of color who have fought for Massachusetts in the revolution, uh, either in local militias or as professional soldiers in the continental line. Uh, one number I have is 2.5% of Massachusetts revolutionary vets were veterans of color, but the more research that goes into it, that, that number might be as high as three or three and a half percent uh, now, it's the, an old outdated statistics. Um, some of the local veterans include Norwell's Asher Freeman. Asher Freeman was born to born enslaved to Phyllis, a woman enslaved by Dr. Isaac Otis in Tack or Jack, a man enslaved by Joseph Foster. As a child through forced separation, again, we're talking about children being separated from their families. Uh, Asher was either sold or given away to Nathan, Nathan, Nathan Christian Esquire. Uh, he served over three years in the Continental Army and when he came back to Norwell, uh, when he came back to Nor Norwell to marry a Mattachusett woman named Dinah Comsett, he adopted the name Freeman and that's what was recorded in his intention to marry. Uh, in Hanover, Private Cuffey Tilden in the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment uh, was raised on slave trader Job Tilden's Hanover property. Uh, Tilden became Lieutenant Tilden and was commissioned into the army. He brought Cuffey with him. Uh, unfortunately, Cuffey did not survive that notoriously harsh winter uh, at Valley Forge, and he is buried in the mass grave there with other revolutionary soldiers. Also in Hanover, and also from the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment, is Hanover's Prince Bailey Dunsick. He was born in Africa. He saw action at Saratoga uh, in the surrender of Burgoyne. He made it back after the war and after marrying in Hanover, he moved to Maine and he lived into, his, into the 1830s. Also in the Revolutionary War is Pembroke's Richard Gundaway. Uh, the Gundaway family uh, is a name, when, when you had phone books, it's a name you would definitely see in local North River area phone books or South Shore area phone books. Uh, and they're still around today. Um, spread out uh, across the South Shore and the New England in the country. Um, Richard Gundaway, a free, he was born a, a, a free person of color and he served one year in the revolution. And again, this one is this slide is tacked activist because don't discount black military service during this period as a form of act activism. Many white people did not want black people to carry guns. George Washington prohibited black men from serving for a short period of time. Uh, but many black men went into the war to make a better life for themselves. For many, it was the first time they were permitted uh, to collect a wage. So, uh, across New England, sometimes they were promised their freedom in exchange for revolutionary service. Sometimes they saved up their, their salary and bought their own freedom. Um, and sometimes they just, when they came back, they're like, I, you know, I was in the Revolutionary War. I'm not going to be enslaved anymore. And they just walked away. Um, you know, these Black people were definitely hearing the rhetoric of their white neighbors about the tyranny of slavery from Britain. Um, you know, the, what they would, you know, for, for the taxation, they considered taxation as a form of slavery. And they uh, we're definitely heard. We know this because we know Elizabeth Freeman's story in Sheffield that she heard all of this talk about uh, independence and freedom. And she said, you, you know, in, if all men are born free and equal, well, what about me? And that was that definitely sunk in to the, the soldiers of the revolution. And they were able to harness that uh, and start life as free people. The next person. Uh, is one of my favorite people. Uh, this is abolitionist Venus Manning. Um, this is post-slavery. So Venus was born enslaved in 1777. Um, and there were several prominent free black communities in Massachusetts after parting, after slavery. Parting Ways in Plymouth is one of them, uh, Beacon Hill in Boston, uh, Tuttlesville in Hingham, and in South Situate in Norwell, there was a very significant free black population. Uh, in self situate slash Norwell, the Sil Sylvester family was well known. Venus Sylvester Manning's brother is Fruitful Sylvester. Uh, he's mentioned in Briggs' shipbuilding uh, account. So if you've read Briggs' shipbuilding closely, 
um, then you've, heard, you've probably seen the name Fruitful Sylvester. Uh, Venus is noteworthy because, like her siblings, she was born enslaved. Uh, and as an adult, she moved into Boston and she was baptized and married. Uh, she, she was baptized and she married Thomas Manning. There she learned how to bank and became a life member of the New England Anti-Slavery Society. So she was a member of the Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, sadly, when she returned to self-situate as a widow, uh, and then she died in 1860 at the dawn of the Civil War. When she died, she was one of the most financially secure single women in town. She was taxed at a higher rate than about 80% of her white male neighbors, and she left an impressive probate file. One of the legacy, legacies she left in her will was a $200 gift to support the abolition of slavery. This would have been equivalent to about five or six months salary for a working person. Uh, and in 1865, five years after her death, a Boston newspaper reports a $100 payout to help newly freed Black people issued on behalf of the Venus Manning Fund. She had her own fund named after her. Five years after she was gone, uh, they issued a $100 payout in the Venus Manning Fund. Just that's incredible. Uh, and it's also incredible that we're seeing her picture. Like, what kind of flex is it that in the 1850s, you have enough money to say, hey, I want to get my picture taken? You know, it wasn't like widespread photography the way it is today. Um, it was a whole rigmarole and it cost a lot of money. It was expensive. But Venus Manning uh, said, I wanted to have my picture taken. And we're lucky enough to see that picture today. Um, she's just an incredible woman. And you should check out my website where I have all the documentation and you can see like, you know, scraps of paper from or, or records from the Provident Institute of Savings in Boston, where she was banking in the 17, 1820s and 1830s. Um, and remember that marriage record that I showed you a couple slides back, Newport and Kate? There's very good circumstantial evidence to suggest that Newport and Kate uh, are Venus and Fruitful's parents. Uh, I can't be 100% sure, but they worked for Nathaniel Sylvester and um, the ages and everything lined up. So I think Venus is heritage goes back to six, 1745. She's the third generation born in the situate Hanover Norwell area of her family, that, that her and her sisters are the third generation um, in fruitful Sylvester kids and several generations of grandchildren, great grandchildren. She's incredible. And this brings us to our my last story um, Sergeant Lemuel Freeman of Norwell. Uh, Lemuel Freeman was the great grandson of Asher Freeman, who I talked about before. Uh, so he was African American, and his great grandmother was also a Mattachese Indian. Um, this picture is of two black men on picket duty. These are not Lemuel Freeman, but uh, it's the I, th I think it's a great picture. 135 South Situate slash Norwell men fought in the Civil War. At the time, the African-American community comprised 5% of Norwell's population uh, at, at 1860, um, at the outset of the war. Yet 9% of Norwell's Civil War veterans were Black. 5% of the population of Situate Norwell was Black, but 9% of the Civil War veterans from that town were Black. So they certainly showed up in numbers. Um, this underscores a major theme of the presentation, that the Black history of the North River is underpinned by activism, or the North River region, I should say. Uh, the small but tight-knit African-American community in Norwell sent 12 of its 48 Black men, that's 25%, to the Civil War. Contrast that number with the fact that 15% of the white men in the town served. So you have to imagine that was a strain on women and families, Black women and families of Norwell at the time. And not to mention, for everybody, the Civil War was, was tough. A lot of men um, came back debilitated or contracting a disease that was, you know, a lifelong health issue and disability. Um, and that's certainly reflected reflected in the early deaths of Black uh, Norwell Civil War veterans. But what's further interesting is two of the residents of South Situate Norwell fought in what was supposed to be all white units. Now remember, um, we were. The revolution was integrated. We talked about how that um, that black men fought alongside white men at, at, as if 
without any hesitation. And what we're told is that the, the military or the armed forces on the ground were strictly segregated through from the end of the revolution past World War II. So it wasn't until Korea, excuse me, that integrated forces fought again. And that's certainly the majority of the case. But what happened is these two men from South Situate uh, joined white units. Uh, recruitment of African-American soldiers did not commence until the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863. And it wasn't until, the, until May when President Lincoln issued General Order 143, which spawned the United States Colored Troops, such as the Massachusetts 54th Infantry, which we know from the movie Glory and the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial in, on Boston Common. Uh, but in September of 1862, Lemuel Freeman, a man enumerated on the census records as both black and mulatto, because again, he had Mattachese heritage, uh, had established in the, uh, had enlisted in the 45th, well, 45th Mass Volunteer Militia Infantry. Before that, he wrote a letter to the governor of Rhode Island requesting to enlist. Um, literature on black men serving in white civil war, war units is sparse, and it's believed that it was rare. But uh, the Militia Act of 1682 authorized states to raise and fill their own militia. And it opened up opportunities for African Americans to serve as soldiers in what was presumed to be white units. Uh, and notably, Lemuel Freeman wasn't the only African-American man from rural to serve in the 45th Mass Volunteers. Albert Winslow had enlisted 15 days before. You know, Freeman was not waiting around for benevolent white politicians to allow him the privilege of fighting in combat. He actively got himself enlisted. Um, you know, for years, Black men were petitioning the right to join the militia. William Cooper Nell, uh, famously wrote about it and urged uh, the, the legislature and the governor to allow it. Uh, so it was the activism, years of activism of black men that allowed Lemuel Freeman to eventually get in, you know, early, you might say, into a white unit. He didn't have to wait for the formation of the 54th and the 55th and the 5th Mass Cavalry. Um, he returned home in 1863, but the life of the professional soldier lured him back. He enlisted for three years in another all-white unit. And on April of 1864, the soon-to-be Sergeant Freeman found, was on the way, on the move south. Lemuel Freeman found himself amidst Ulysses S. Grant's costly but necessarily necessary overland campaign. By mid-June, Sergeant Freeman had survived Cold Harbor in the first assault on Petersburg. It was there, sadly, that Freeman was shot and killed while on picket duty. Uh, Lemuel's story is fascinating because it upends what we think we know about black soldiers fighting for the United States Army in the Civil War. But it also calls attention to the fact that there are eight, and possibly nine, uh, I, I, I've located eight gravestones, Civil War gravestones, veterans of Civil War veterans in uh, Norwell's First Pirate Cemetery. That to me is astounding. There are at least eight headstones of black Civil War veterans in First Parish Cemetery. I don't know, at least in this region, where that would have the same number of um, of black revolutionary and uh, black Civil War soldiers and so on. And there might be a ninth. Alan Prouty of the uh, Norwell Historical Society pointed out uh, Napoleon Powell, which I mistook because I read a a census record that says he's white, but other records says he's black. So it might there might be nine uh, nine graves at First Parish that are Civil War veterans uh, with the traditional government headstone that we've come to know, um, anybody that's walked local historic uh, cemeteries. Uh, and I, I just think that's an astounding cultural resource that we all have in our backyard. I, it never occurred to me that there would be a cluster of, of, of nine Black Civil War veterans. And I think we should all, if you're ever in Norway, you should stop by and pay your respects uh, because in other towns it's one, two, maybe three uh, and they're spread out. So. Uh, I think that's a great place to end as well. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, I, I've been saying something like this for a very long time, but Abid said it better than me. Um, me until these histories are fully told and embedded into large narratives of colonial New England, 
our understanding of the past and present will not only be incomplete, but crucially flawed. Uh, so I hope you've learned something today. Uh, and I hope you take it to heart and you, you sit on it, you think about it for a while. And just when you think about colonial New England, I hope you think of other people beyond, besides pilgrims and the descendants of, descendants of pilgrims and um, who can we call a patriot? Who do we deserve to commemorate uh, in this coming uh, 250, 250th anniversary in 1775 of the, the start of the revolution? Uh, so the things I want, I hope people take away, slavery was common, mundane, and spread across class and injury in industries in Massachusetts. Um, it was not kinder or benign. It was violent, and there was a lot of family separation. Uh, the business of slavery, the Atlantic economy, um, was the underpinning of all of New England's economy. Um, and the Black history of this region is underpinned by Black activism. Uh, so with that, I will toss it back to Brian and see, I'd love to take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. That's, um, this is just incredibly uh, interesting. And um, yes, we do have some questions. I will say, um, I did put uh, in the chat a link to the 11 Names Project um, in there. So go in there and, and check it out because there's a lot of really incredible, very local information. In fact, um, really quick, when I was digging through uh, a little bit, Lemuel Freeman um, happens to have lived, there's records of him living uh, around 230 South Street, uh, near the South Street Mill Street near the Hanover Y, which is right next door to the watershed's office on uh, South Street. Um, and of course, then, uh, as Wayne did a little further digging, found that there were land dealings between him and the Clapp family who used to own the, the watershed's house. So it's just incredibly local history and connections that you can make here in your community. Uh, and so it's just, uh, I definitely encourage all of you to go check out that website and to see the, there's a, a whole wealth of information that Wayne, as well as others, uh, have, have, uh, have, have found. Um, and so, so thank you, Wayne. Your, your talk was just, uh, it's just incredibly interesting. And I know we're only just scratching the surface of what you have out there. So um, yeah, just a few questions here. If anyone has, wants to put some questions in there, go ahead. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We'll be respectful to Wayne's time, but um, there is his email right there and he is welcome to any uh, questions to send his way. In fact, he, he mentioned to me that he encourages it. So please um, feel free to reach out um, uh, if you have any further questions or if we don't get to them. So um, I'll go ahead and ask some here. Um, when, uh, so Wayne, when the Northern states started to abolish slavery, what percentage of Northern whites were opposed to the abolishment and uh, what groups won um, out to get, went out to get the abolishment accomplished? Uh, wow, what a, I'll break it down a little bit. So in New England, there's different emancipation dates for different states. There's no one blanket Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Hampshire, they all abolish at the same time. They're, they all have different slavery laws and they all have different abolition laws. Here in Massachusetts, it was, like I said, the 70 freedom suits that were brought by enslaved people over the course of 120, 110, 120 years, um, consistently people suing, trying to play the English's game. Like, well, if you're gonna make the rules, we're going to play by your rules and we're gonna bring you to court and we're going to try to uh, sue for our freedom. Um, it was that pressure um, that was a major factor in the abolition of slavery here in Massachusetts. Most of those freedom suits failed, but they set up the legal precedent that eventually where uh, it just was, you know, once uh, John Adams wrote, all men are created free or born free and equal, in the Massachusetts Constitution, um, that combined with the with the um, the freedom suits and the activism of Black people is really what pushed um, towards an end of slavery. An another, another factor is, um, you know, people were reeling. There was a lot more resistance and a lot more organizing, and um, it was harder to keep people enslaved in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, but slavery was petering out a little bit 
by the time we get to the revolution. And then when the revolution happened, um, there's a lot of opportunity and chaos. Men, enslaved men went and fought in the war and either came back free or maybe they just didn't come back. There's a, an instance of um, Primus Cobus. He just stayed in Maryland. Uh, he did not come back to the North. He did not come back to uh, where his brethren were, were enslaved. He was he started a new life. Um, or people just walked off the farm because their master was out fighting a war. Um, interestingly, in Connecticut, the la slavery really wasn't abolished until 1848. Uh, in Rhode Island, well into the early 1800s, slavery was uh, was tolerated and practiced. So when James Madison in the 1790s was talking about free soil, um, it wasn't accurate. Uh, slavery was abolished later than we think uh, uh, up north, but a lot of it had to do with the activism of Black people. Thanks, Wayne. Um, has DNA been any help in identifying descendants? That's a good question. I don't know much about DNA gene genealogy, but um, some of the people I do write about, their descendants have contacted me and said, hey, I am a great grandson of this person or that person. So I think it would take a, a concerted effort, like they would have to, um, people would have to learn that they come from some of these, you know, not everybody's great with family history. Sometimes it's hidden because of pain or sometimes the mythology of this being rare and there's no way we could find these records uh, persists. Uh, but, you know, if that's something that I, you know, for my own selfishness, I hope um, happens. But on the other hand, I can understand why some people are skeptical of selling their DNA to, uh, to big corporations to find it. But I don't know anything about that. Okay. Yeah, there's um, a few points in here of people like, so for example, someone said, not a question, but both Richard Gundaway and Asher Freeman are my fourth great grandfathers. So we. Uh, what, amazing, what amazing heritage that like imagine having two revolutionary war veterans and not only that uh one was a a free black his, his story is incredible and free black person and then another person was born into slavery separated from his parents uh but you know started a family in um asher freeman has i, I only talked about lemuel freeman but he has two other great grandsons who are civil war veterans it's a very interesting connection if you look at black civil war veterans a lot of times they have a revolutionary ancestor so there's just this heritage of service to their country that, that goes wholly unrecognized except within families who have done their own family history. But I think the whole community as a whole needs to really start talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, were, uh, were slaves considered collateral uh, or property which was listed on deed records? I do have some deeds uh, that where enslaved people are listed. One of the one of the deeds I have is an answer. Uh, what I believe it's, it's speculative. Um, you know, it, sometimes you can only speculate or hypothesize. I think on my site there's a story about the Gundaway family um, and some of their relatives, and I think I have a deed from 1704 that lists the manumission of Richard Gundaway's ancestors in Plymouth in 1704. Um, and a few other deeds that were like, there's a, a transaction in Pembroke. It was Duxbury at the time, but a transaction in Pembroke where they're selling land. And oh, also uh, my quote unquote Negro man, he was, he was thrown into the land deed. Um, but a lot of times those, in Connecticut, one minister was so bad with finances, he took out a mortgage on his enslaved man. So yes. Uh, enslaved people were definitely currency, capital, uh, and assets. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, Vernon Briggs, author of Shipling on the North River, was a remarkably enlightened physician, writer, and human being. Why do you think he does not mention slavery in his text, which was written after the Civil oh, War? Oh, he does. Um, if you read, if you read Shipbuilding, or maybe I'm confusing it, but um, maybe it's it's either in Shipbuilding or his um, um, uh, genealogy, he actually gives a very enlightened history of uh, slavery in Massachusetts uh, that is very similar. Like you wouldn't have to do a lot to update it, to, to provide it for a modern audience. Um, and he actually addressed, so, you know, that, that um, original, this bill of sale, 
uh, it comes from a Vernon Briggs book. He's talking about his ancestor who bought an enslaved child and he had, he still had the original bill of sale. Um, I, I, I'm very, he, you know, he does say some problematic stuff. He, he was definitely not perfect. Um, but as far as when he, the way he treats racial history, uh, it's a very sensitive and progressive for the time. You know, you, you couldn't really pass it off today, but very progressive for the time. Um, uh, historian. Okay. Um, what's the origin of the 11 names? Um, I did a project about uh, the Dudley family in Roxbury. Um, it was going to be like a one-off essay. And I could recall people saying, well, we may never know if um, the Dudley family were enslavers. Uh, and, you know, on my couch, I was able to pick out, figure out, document, yes, they were enslaved enslavers. Uh, and I was able to identify 11 individuals or 11 names of people that were enslaved by the Dudley family. And I just needed something kind of catchy rather than let's learn about slavery in Massachusetts, you know? Makes sense. Um, so a little two-parter here, I believe. So um, the graveyard that you mentioned where the Civil War veterans are buried, that was the first parish? First um, parish of okay. Norwell. Okay, right near the downtown center? Yep, Okay. in the Unitarian Church. Okay, great. Uh, and at the beginning, um, there was the picture of Venus Manning's grave. Where was that photo taken? Um, or I don't have it. You, that was I, on your... Yeah, um, it was... It, that also first parish. Um, if there's two different ways you can find it. If you have find a grave on your phone, I've GPS tagged it. So you can go right to it, like it will take you right to you. But if you're a little more old fashioned, uh, don't park on the main street side, the park on the other side, I forget the name of the street, the small street that connects, uh, that starts by kind of by the church parking lot and it goes down to the Norris Reservation. Mm -hmm. Go onto that side and enter this cemetery. There's a, there's a gravel path that bisects the cemetery. So enter on that gravel path. As soon as you get in, take a left, uh, walk probably 10 or 15 paces. And then on your right, there's a bank of six um, stones. It's the, the entire Sylvester family. Uh, Venus Manning is there. Hoople Sylvester is there. His wife and their four sisters are all buried there. And it's this very impressive monument. It, they're, they're, they're the earliest stone I can find in First Parish for Black people. Even though Black people were being buried there for over 100 years, they Again, they had that financial success where they were able to, uh, you know, show off a little bit and have headstones for each uh, of the siblings. And it's a, a wonderful and beautiful monument. And again, when you're there to check out uh, the Civil War headstones, go uh, have a moment with Venus Manning and Fruitful Sylvester. Thanks, Wayne. Um, the Civil War monument in Norwell Center has the names of men who lost their lives in the Civil War. Are any of those slaves or black men? For the Civil War, well, all right, I don't know. There is a mystery in Norwell. There are two men, uh, Patterson, James Patterson, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, Napoleon Powell that I mentioned. Circumstantial evidence suggests that maybe, perhaps, I don't know, might have been, uh, you know, what we used to call them fugitive slaves, but we, now we call them self-emancipated or freedom seekers. Um, they they might have come from North Carolina and then eventually joined uh, Black Civil War units up here in Massachusetts. Uh, Patterson, I think it's Pete, no, Peterson. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, he's in Norwell as early as 1753 when he gets married. Uh, but you know, anybody who's looking for a mystery to solve, I would highly encourage, you know, looking that up. Um, you can get the names of all the Black Revolutionary War soldiers from uh, in Norwell on my website about this story from uh, Lemuel Freeman. Um, and if you figure it out, please let me know, because this is one of the things I would love to learn someday. Thanks, Wayne. We've, we've got a few more if, if, uh, if you still have the time. Is that all right? I have it. Yeah, I have okay. it. There's a lot of great questions here. Um, what impact did the abolition, the abolition of slavery in Britain have on New England? I don't know. That's, uh, you know, the abolition of slavery in England, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. Um, here's another one. I had the opportunity to meet Wayne last June. I was amazed at his passion uh, he has for the forgotten patriots of color. Thanks for bringing this, um, these patriots to the enslaved people of New England to light. 
Um, question, did the slaveholders receive payment for the men who went to serve? Or, and furthermore, were they freed upon enlistment? I can speak to that broadly. I don't know specifically about the soldiers that, in the North River area, but I do know sometimes the soldiers, the black soldiers' wages and bounty were indeed garnished by their enslaver, or sometimes they would take half and leave the other half to the enslaver. Um, sometimes the, the soldier took home all of their money. Um, but yes, th there was definitely times, and especially in other colonies and, and states where the enslaver garnished the entire wages. And there are instances where um, there's a man, uh, I forget his name, but he originates in Rhode Island and ends up in Marblehead. He was promised his freedom. He was told, if you go serve in my son's stead in, in the revolution for three years, I will grant you your freedom when you come back to uh, Kingstown, Rhode Island. I think it's Kingstown. And he, he was getting his freedom. Other men just saved up their money and then purchased their freedom. Thanks, Wayne. Um, what was the impetus for ending slavery in New England? Uh, it was becoming untenable. Um, you know, there's no cash crops. So the, the black population was growing. Uh, so, you know, uh, even if you want to be an enslaver, you can't support uh, growing families, these growing black families. And it just wasn't a market for infants. Um, like I said, they get given away. And you can see, read in some of the trading houses where they're writing to the West Indies desperate, like, will you take some of these infants? And they're like, no, if they can't work, they're not valuable to us. But we don't want, um, we don't want black children. Uh, so I think part of it was, it's just becoming untenable with the growing black population. Um, the shift from being an agrarian society, like the start of industrialization, where white men were moving into towns and um, needed jobs. And, you know, so they would, they didn't want slavery to continue because they wanted to work shipyards and mills and other places like that. Um, and again, like I was saying before, the, the activism of black people resisting slavery, running away from slavery, taking advantage of the revolution and the freedom suits. Thanks, Wayne. Um, this is a, a comment followed by a question. I know, at least in Pembroke, a few shipbuilders were abolitionists and some had involvement in the Underground Railroad. Was there a number of shipbuilders that became abolitionists due to their disgust of slavery in the industry? Or did some shipbuilders become abolitionists as their trade could be used to transport runaways to their freedom? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I usually stop if it's not I usually stop at 1783 with researching unless it's a descendant of an enslaved person. So as far as abolition and the North River, I don't know much about it. Uh, what I will say is a lot of people whose parents or grandparents or great parents, great grandparents were enslavers, became abolition, abolitionists as a way to kind of whitewash family history. This is this happened in Rhode Island with the hazards. Um, it happened all throughout Massachusetts. You, you know, like you'll see the even in, 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 in North River communities, um, I have, uh, I can tell you the names of people who were enslavers, last names. You know, two generations later, you could see the names of their descendants show up on anti slavery and abolition petitions. Um, so I don't know if they were motivated, I don't know if shipbuilders were motivated by abolition or altruism or uh, anything. I will say, the last slave ship built in South Shore was built in Cohasset in 1839. Uh, probably not directly for the purpose of transporting enslaved people, but that is, you know, we do see um, the South Shore benefiting from, you know, slave sh ships that transport enslaved people well into the 1800s. Thanks, Wayne. Um... For, for getting at those questions. There are, a, a, yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to 
um, end it there. There's some questions that are regarding relatively local, um, in like very, very local specific information. I'll just, I'll, let me just ask one more, um, uh, is re in regards to um, the, um, the Cornette Stetson mm -hmm. and um, uh, did you find any records between Cornette Stetson or South Situate and or his descendants as slaveholders? Does that name? Mm -hmm. I'd have to look at my, I have a spreadsheet for the entirety of Situate that lists uh, records. It's 159 records of enslaved people uh, in Situate. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I, I've come across no evidence of Cornet Stetson being a, an enslaver, but as far as his descendants, I bet there's a good chance that it, at least one or two of them were enslavers, but um, you can reach out for me to that and I'll, I'll double check my uh, my records. Email me at wade.tucker at gmail.com. Okay. I'll tell okay. you, and I can list out what Stetsons I have in my notes. Okay. Um, do you know if, if a community, oh, I'm sorry, Wayne, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Just, I, and I, I don't know for sure that they do, if any, if I have it, I'll, I'll, I'll share it. Okay. Okay. Do you know of a community of slaves in situate called Wildcat? Yeah. 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 That, that I, um, that's what is kind of on like all of the, the signage um, in kind of that Circuit Street area. They work, they, I think um, a lot of the black population in in Norwell was concentrated on Circuit Street and what was hard scrabbling. I don't think that um, street lives, uh, you know, bisects anymore. But um, like I said, the, so the population, the, the the, the population in, in 1860, the population of black people in South Situate was about 5% of the population. And they were very tight knit. If you go back to Venus Manning, she had no children, but there are, are plenty of names you would recognize if you're familiar with the black community of the time. In her probate file is George Lee, um, uh, you know, Thomas Howard Gunderway, um, Benjamin Franklin Lee, who was a, a, a Civil War veteran. Uh, he's buried in Hanover, but he hails from South Situate slash Norwell. Um, it was a very tight knit community. Like you can see the evidence, more and more evidence is surfacing where uh, that, what was called the Wildcat area, uh, where they lived near Wildcat Hill, the, the, the black community was concentrated in that area. Um, they were very tight knit and um, there's just a ton of, a ton more to be learned about that. Thanks, Wayne. We'll just do one one more here. Um, the North River is distinguished for its skilled shipbuilders and craftsmen, seeding shipyards in Boston and New York. Once the rivers no longer supported the construction of larger ships, are there black craftsmen that you know? Names of uh, the skilled um, who became significant as they migrated to larger shipyards? No, that's a great question, and that is something that has been on my mind. You know, obviously. Um, you know, it's kind of like a house, like you see a house and it's like, this house was erected by John, John Clapp in 1749. Jo yeah, but he wasn't the only person, you know, it takes more than one person to build a house. So whose hands were actually working on that house? You know, and the same with ships. Um, you know, it's not a one man operation, even though some aspects of it could be, uh, you have to, if, you know, we see that example with Daniel on, on, on Watton shipyards. He is labeled as a ship carpenter at age 20. So you have to imagine that in the time of slavery, they certainly, Black people enslaved who worked in the shipyard acquired skills. Um, and then after slavery was abolished, they had these portable skills. And you have to imagine that there was a good cadre all across Massachusetts and New England of skilled black shipwrights. But unfortunately, uh, I don't know anything about it, but it's something I will be looking forward to look, looking into in the future. Thanks, Wayne. I, one last, I, there's several yeah. questions regarding um, uh, slaves as it, uh, uh, and as it inc could include native, uh, people of native heritage. Mm -hmm. um, what um, sort of to lump a few questions together, is it possible that many of these descendants were on the, uh, that were on the Southern auction blocks were in fact of, of native heritage? Um, maybe not in the American South, but certainly the West Indies. Um, it got to the point where 
think it's either Barbados or Antigua, um, there was such an influx of Native Americans from New England being sold into slavery there that they eventually outlawed the practice. They said no more importation of uh, New England Indians. Um, more, I don't, there might have been some who ended up in South Carolina, uh, North Carolina. I don't know off the top of my head, um, but also early in, in the 17th century, some of the enslaved people would come from places like Florida and South Carolina were native indigenous people of those areas who were brought here to Massachusetts to be enslaved. Oh, um, there's a case where um, a Wampanoag man, uh, the Wampanoag men and black men uh, in the 1800s became mariners because it was a, one of the few trades open to them where they could make good money. Um, there's a story, I don't remember his name, but if you email me, I, I can email you the, the details. It's a Wampanoag man, 1832, goes up in um, New Orleans and he's immediately apprehended, he's immediately arrested and they tried to sell him into slavery and the Massachusetts governor had to petition to get him read. But certainly kind of like uh, the Solomon Northrop story, the 12 years of slave, um, definitely Native American men, especially maybe uh, with a darker complexion, were at risk of being uh, stolen and impressed into slavery. This, this, uh, this has just all been so fascinating, Wayne. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to to present this information to us and to answer uh, some of these questions. This, Thank you. Um, this is really important uh, local history here, and uh, we're really um, fortunate to have you digging up a lot of this real unfortunate and unpleasant history that uh, that I agree with you that that really um, needs to be made light of uh, and, uh, and and seen and and, and heard. So thanks again, um, Wayne, for for taking the time. Really appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, so folks, just uh, his email is right there. Please. Definitely, if you have any questions uh, that we weren't able to answer or or any follow-up questions, please feel free to uh, email him. Um, and uh, definitely check out the 11 Names Project. Um, it's an incredibly interesting um, uh, newsletter. And there's new parts coming out pretty much weekly. Um, and so it's uh, really just fascinating history. Um, and uh, uh, so please um, um, check that out. So. Um, thanks again, Wayne. I, I really appreciate your time with us tonight and um, uh, and all the, the research that you did for this as well as have been doing. So so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, please, uh, uh, thanks again for all of you that are out there joining us and uh, uh, join us next Wednesday. We had to do a little rearrange in the schedule. And so next Wednesday's um, uh, the 22nd um will be um making our salt marshes more climate resilient so we'll have a hydrologist we'll have a watershed ecologist um and a a um, coastal resilience director um talking about um, how our salt marshes can help heal and adapt to our um to uh withstand rising sea levels and the importance to maintain their ecological value here in our our community. So um, please join us next week for that. And so um, once again, a, a very special thank you to our sponsors, Clean Harbors, Clear Water Recovery, and the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Duxbury, Hanover, Marshfield, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate. We all uh, very much appreciate their support for educational programs just like this. So with that, um, I want a, a special thanks to Doug and Mass Audubon, of course, uh, for helping with this program. Very special thanks to Wayne Tucker for this, uh, this incredible presentation tonight. And thank all of you for tuning in and joining us. This re uh, program will be recorded and put on our website and YouTube. So um, if you would like to share it with others, please feel free to do so. It usually will take a day or two to get out there, but it will be there. And we'll let you know about that. So thank all of you so much for joining and have a great rest of your night.